thanks for a wonderful session there. Definitely sparked some ideas and thoughts. And for those watching, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Please, please share with me in the chat. Our next panel will look at how we can increase access to that which lawyers dared to enter law school to champion, quite daring, I'd say, justice. And more specifically, increasing access to it. This should be fantastic. From grassroots efforts to organizational changes, let's dive in together to learn of these solutions for access to justice. Hello, Tiffany. Hey, Sherry. <laughs> so our discussion today, I want to kind of give us uh, an overview. Uh, right now, access to justice, uh, the inaccessibility to justice, I should say, it's a major issue. And so in this conversation, what we're going to talk about are the ways that courts, uh, lawyers, pro bono groups, uh, their firms uh, are advancing efforts increasing the access to justice in a variety of ways. And so we're going to unpack a lot of that. But I think first, I was hoping you could go ahead and introduce yourself, Tiffany, and where you're broadcasting from. Sure. Uh, Tiffany Graves, I am pro bono counsel at Bradley, uh, a law firm with 10 offices uh, in six states and Washington, D.C. I am resident in our Charlotte, North Carolina office. Uh, and as pro bono counsel, I'm responsible for directing our pro bono practice uh, and also managing our relationship with legal services organizations and nonprofit organizations. Well, Tiffany, it is absolutely a privilege to be talking with you today about this topic and, and all the good work you do. And I think one of the things that brought us together, uh, among some others, uh, Litera TV notably, um, was the fact that in our Changing Lawyer publication, which we released a, a number of months ago, and we're paralleling that publication in this conversation, um, it turns out that one of the women that we quoted about access to justice, you two are sort of followers of one another on Twitter. And I just have to read what Chief Justice Bridget McCormick said in one of her recent tweets. She said, this pandemic was obviously not the disruption we wanted but I think it might have been the disruption we needed in the courts to be able to accelerate change in a way I hope can produce a justice system that's more accessible and more transparent and more efficient. And you had some thoughts about Bridget's comments too and about Bridget herself. Yes, uh, she is outstanding. Um, I think what I share with you, Sherry, is I would just love to clone her and let her be the chief justice of every Supreme Court in the United States. Uh, the way that she is so forward thinking, uh, not only just about the court system in general, but about facilitating access to justice is something that would be just fantastic to see throughout the country. Uh, that quote you read uh, just resonates with me as, you know, sort of demonstrating a judge who really does sort of understand the issues of our access to justice gap and the court's role and responsibility in helping to close that gap, gap along with attorneys and pro bono and a number of other components. Um, but that's such a good quote, um, you know, just seeing this as a challenging opportunity to bring about some much needed change. And I think there's some interesting things about her. One is that she is a tech enthusiast. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that that dimension, of course, um, in her role, you know, that I don't necessarily want to say it as generalized as this might seem, but in the court systems, there's not been a lot of access to technology. So the fact that what we now have is access to technology or certainly the, the groundswell to bring it there, um, she has seen this moment as a way to really, you know, evangelize that. Um, I think the other part that, that has struck me about her is she she sees it as her responsibility. And that, that I, tell me about that, because I think that resonates with you as well. It sure does. Um, you know, another quote that she made that's in the Changing Lawyer publication is, you know, we use this as an opportunity to make lemons out of lemonade. Um, you know, she is very, again, forward thinking about all of this. Um, most courts are not. Um, so, you know, to have someone who is willing to be public facing 
um, as mm -hmm. a Supreme Court justice, you know, in saying we need to use this opportunity, frankly, to do something we should have done a long time ago. You know, this pandemic has forced us to really look at what we're doing in our courts with respect to technology. And we should use this moment to make sure that we never find ourselves in a situation where we're having to make these quick pivots again, but also as an opportunity to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make our courts accessible to the public. You know, she uses customer friendly. I mean, you don't hear a lot of judges talking <laughs> like that, um, but the courts should be. The courts are for the people. Um, so I, it's just refreshing to have someone, you know, in the judiciary who is as public as she is with identifying her role as a judge as being a part of solution. And and I think uh, taking, a, shall we call it a, a problem uh, in the courts, a, a problem for the people, which was the transportation comment, yeah, that that you know, transportation, if you want to share with our audience what you're sharing to, with me about that. Absolutely. I mean, by making the sort of pivot to virtual hearings and virtual court proceedings, that is a way of facilitating access for a number of people who simply lack access to transportation. We take for granted when we live in large cities that there's transit opportunities for everyone. Well, not everybody lives in a large city. <laughs> Many people in our country live in very rural areas where there's right. no bus, there's no train, there's no metro. So being able to get to court might require having to take a ton of time off from work, you know, might require you using the car so that someone else in your family who needs it can't use it. You might not have gas to put gas money to, to pay for gas to put in the car. So when you're able to participate virtually in these court proceedings, it really sort of levels the playing field and allows those those individuals who are involved in in court hearings uh, to be present uh, and not to mm -hmm. have the stresses that sometimes come with trying to figure out how to get to the courthouse. Right. So so this again, this was a, a, a really great way for us to kind of kick off our conversation because there are many initiatives um, you know, with the current that are current and there's active focus on. Um, so let's start by talking about you and your role as pro bono counsel at Bradley. And, um, you know, what are the initiatives that you've connected to and your and your firm has connected to in order to increase access to justice? Well, I think much like the courts and having to sort of, you know, make these shifts to, you know, innovative approaches to be able to facilitate access, uh, pro bono attorneys have had to do the same. You know, yeah. we still have pro bono cases. We still have clients that we need to meet with. And while we can't do that in person, we had to find ways uh, in order to make sure that our clients were able to communicate with us and vice versa. So what, what has happened really in the pro bono community in partnership with legal aid organizations is we're having virtual legal clinics, virtual help desks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we get referrals from legal aid organizations, we're finding ways to connect with our clients telephonically, you know, video conferencing, those sorts of things, so that they know as pro bono attorneys, we're still fit there for them. We're still advancing their legal matters. Um, so we've even had to make those same types of shifts. You know, it was a little easier on the law firm side because most of us do have technologies in place, um, but a lot of our legal aid partners did not, you know, so we were wow. able to lend support for them give them the time and space to get where they needed to be all along trying to communicate with the individuals who'd reached out for legal assistance so that they still knew we were in their corner um, and advocating for them. So, you know, it's, it's made us look at how we communicate. We've also seen over the course of the pandemic an increase uh, in a lot of legal issues that we've always sort of handled on a pro bono basis mm -hmm. that been really ramped up, frankly, because of the pandemic. Uh, and specifically, I'm thinking about things like domestic violence cases. You know, early on in the pandemic throughout the country, really throughout the world, uh, we saw an increase in interpersonal violence. Uh, and, you know, folks who were approaching legal aid organizations to say, I need an order of protection because I'm not safe in my home. You know, those sorts of things. And we were all home. So, you know, right. think about the situation where you really don't have anywhere to go. Um, so we saw an increase in those cases. We've all sort of heard about the eviction crisis. Um, 
And while we've sort of felt effects of that throughout the pandemic, um, we're really seeing it now, you know, with the lifting of the federal moratorium uh, and folks trying to keep mm -hmm. stay in their homes. Um, immigration issues um, have also ratcheted up over the course of the pandemic. Some of that has to do with sort of changes in regulations with the change administration. Um, you know, some of those cases that were dormant for a while, all of a sudden are getting active. Um, so there's just been a lot uh, happening, not to mention, you know, a number of firms are helping uh, Afghan re refugees. Right. Uh, so there's there's a lot of work happening in pro bono, again, in partnership with legal services organizations. We haven't stopped despite there being a pandemic, um, but we've had right. to make some shifts to make sure that our clients could communicate with us effectively and that they, again, knew that we were still doing everything we could to, to work for them. And I, I was curious, too, you were sharing with me that there are now um, self-help kinds of resources, uh, forms and videos and guides and things like that. So tell us a little bit about that and how those tools are helping. You know, again, thinking about technology and how technology and innovation can be used to access justice. You know, some of those things that Judge McCormick and others have put in place is they've taken a hard look at state Supreme Court websites um, and, you know, said, what are we what are we what are we making available on our websites that people can easily access to get into courthouses? So you're seeing more sample pleadings. Um, you know, documents that would help people file complaints, file petitions to really get legal matters started um, that, you know, some courts have always had available on their websites, but not everybody. In fact, I would say not right. most courts. So right. now we're realizing because of this moment, we have this means of communicating with people, of, of, of you know, helping them get the sort of information that they need. Let's make it available. Um, some courts do a really great job of having self-help centers in the courthouses where wow. people can meet with individual lawyers or access forms and information. I think we're, we're seeing and we'll continue to see a rollout of more of those in light of some of the things that we've seen over the past two years. So, again, these are all things that put information um, and, and legal documents in the hands of people who would not otherwise be able to access this information. Exactly. And I, I feel as if I, I'm thinking of, you know, professional services and, and this is really making the courts more welcoming exactly. and more, um, uh, shall we say, equalizing yeah. more for the public, their access to um, to the court system and to uh, legal services, really. Yes. Um, so I also wanted to talk with you about um, a, a recent, I guess it's really a, a whole sort of maybe international, but a national event at least, uh, where it was pro bono week, uh, just like a week ago. Yeah. Um, and so tell us about pro bono week and tell us about some of the ways at your firm uh, pro bono week was, you know, again, adjunct to increasing access to justice. Sure. Um, you know, the ABA has designated, you know, it's typically the last week in October uh, is National Celebration of Pro Bono. And it's really an opportunity to sort of spotlight and celebrate the contributions of legal aid organizations and, and their pro bono partners. You know, pro bono is one component of sort of the access to justice puzzle, but it's, it's a pretty significant one. Uh, and the more lawyers we have engaged in pro bono work, the closer we get to meeting the overwhelming need that exists for, for legal services. So I appreciate the ABA in, in making this effort to sort of acknowledge the role that pro bono plays in facilitating access to justice. So in the U.S., uh, it's the last week in October. The U.K. has the first week in November. And Ireland has one in a, in a couple of weeks as well. So, you know, this has really become, as you said, Sherry, an international celebration mm -hmm. of the importance of pro bono work. And at Bradley, you know, what we did this year and, and every year we sort of do something different to sort of commemorate the week and, and find ways to, you know, promote pro bono at our firm. This year we had daily information sessions that focused on five of the areas in which we regularly do pro bono. So we do pro bono in more than five areas, mm -hmm. um, but, but we do it a lot um, in immigration, in death penalty cases in supporting small business owners, 
uh, in domestic violence work and also in obtaining or, or, or receiving uh, referrals from federal courts, uh, appointments when there are pro se litigants who could use the help of a pro bono attorney. So those are big areas for us. And because we brought in new attorneys and because we're always interested to get more of our attorneys engaged in those areas, we decided to offer those learning sessions to really expose our attorneys to what those cases look like and what it means to represent clients who are involved with those types of issues. So we were fortunate to have some of our legal aid partners from across our firm's footprint offer these pro, uh, pro bono learning days for our attorneys. And then we also invited attorneys who are handling those types of cases to talk about their experiences so that there would be that sort of relatability mm -hmm. factor. And you could say, OK, if she did it, I can do it, too. Mm -hmm. So we did that daily. And then in addition to that, we had practical ways for people to plug in. So we had legal clinics basically in every office. All of them were virtual for the most part, except for two that were in person, actually. Um, so that was a way to say, OK, you're doing some learning, which is great. But we also want you doing some pro bono. Uh, so throughout the week, we offered opportunities in each of our 10 offices for lawyers to actually engage in pro bono work in partnership with the legal aid organization. What a great week. Uh, honestly, that that's in so incredible. And, you know, you mentioned the ABA and how grateful you were that they honored such a week. But there is also an IBA, an yes. International Bar Association. Yes. Um, which, again, in in this discussion, you know, the realization that access to justice is an international issue. Mm -hmm. It is it is everywhere. And so the IBA um, is sponsoring an event coming up. And I was hoping you could share with our audience about it because they too have access to it. Absolutely. Um, you're so right. It is an international issue. Um, you know, the other hat that I wear is, is as co-president of the Association of Pro Bono Counsel. Uh, and, and ABCO really provides support to the law firm pro bono community, not just in the U.S., but across the country. Uh, and we have global members from you know, many different countries. And I can assure you, they are facing the same challenges as we mm. are in the United States. Um, so it is truly an international issue that we're all working uh, to, to find solutions for and, and to make better. Um, but on December 15th, the International Bar Association uh, is, you know, is hosting a panel that is titled Creativity in the Pro Bono Sector a response to international crises. And it's gonna feature panels, uh, panelists from the United States, from the UK, from South Africa, and from Australia. Uh, and I'm honored to be you know, amongst this group, sort of talking about some of the challenges we've seen in the United States in particular. And so in this, in this panel, in this discussion, in this event, you all will be collaborating and sharing solutions, correct? That's correct. That's correct. It is, you know, the focus of this panel is really on three strategies, mm -hmm. um, innovation, inter and intra, intra law firm collaboration and pro bono association. And the idea is for each of us to talk about how we've used one or more of those strategies to sort of deal with access to justice issues. So it's our opportunity to provide perspective from our country uh, on what we have found to be solutions to access to justice, to facilitating access to justice. So in that innovation topic, uh, any any aspects of it uh, dealing with technology specifically? Or of course. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, my remarks I think will focus less on the innovation aspects and more on sort of the law firm collaboration and pro bono piece. However, um, you know, we've had a planning call. So we've got some of my colleagues who are going to talk specifically about how they have utilized technology, how they've utilized platforms to connect individuals with need to attorneys who can help them. Um, so definitely so, meant so much room for innovation in this space, uh, in the pro bono world. And we utilize it as much as we can to really connect people without resources to organizations and, and individual attorneys and law firms who can help them with their situations. So in, a, in the Changing Lawyer Summit uh, that we had a year ago, 
this was one of the panelists comments was that we all should keep watch on the area of access to justice, the areas of pro bono counsel assistance in this, uh, because the technologies will, will emerge from there, if you will, perhaps quicker than it may emerge from other aspects, but that these tools that will be leveraged for it, um, they're just going to be able to incubate faster and they're going to be able to show results faster. Mm -hmm. And of course the need is so great um, mm -hmm. that it will bring diverse talent to it. So I'm just curious your experience with that, your thoughts on that. Well, it's, I, I agree with it wholeheartedly. You know, I think what has made technology and the access to justice space successful is because it's often driven by the people who need it the most. Right. What I think we are very intentional about in this work is not forgetting the people that we serve. It's really easy to sort of sit in conference rooms in our law firms and think amongst ourselves about what people need from us as pro bono. Um, but if you're not communicating with the people who are going to actually be served through these technological means, then you're really not, not thinking about it in the right way um, and, and not really making sure the people who actually are going to access it or, or who are going to access it are going to use it and that it's right. going to be productive and effective for them. So you have to be, you have to be very intentional about how you're engaging community and developing these projects. And I think that's what we do really well in access to justice and pro bono. We really try to keep community at the forefront of what we're doing, because if they can't get to it, it's not right. going to matter. You can spend all this time in developing these great forms and these great platforms. But if people can't access it, it's not going to be good. Or if they can and it doesn't still solve the issues that they're seeing in their daily lives, it's not going to be successful. So I do think there's some some real value in learning from um, some of the things that have come out of mm -hmm. access to justice leaders uh, who have worked very closely with legal technologists and others to develop things that really are successful in helping people and reaching those who need it. And I'm I'm very curious, just sort of the, oh, I don't know the quite the right word, but just the the makeup of this in terms of leveling the playing field somehow or of of really making collaborations like like you say so completely concentrated on the people mm -hmm. um and and like even the pandemic right we we've all been able to talk like this and and meet so many other people and hear so many other accents as you were <laughs> sharing with me yeah. um it just it has it been the great facilitator much to Bridget's point. Yeah, I, I think it has. Um, and, and I think, you know, you can and we all have seen this period in time and been incredibly frustrated at points. <laughs> um, and and I, we're human and that's going to happen. Um, but I do think the whole making lemon out lemons out of lemonade idea has been crucial for really advancing some things in this process. Um, you know, collaboration, like you said, more of us are hopping on these video mm -hmm. meetings and coming up with ideas and approaches and strategies that are changing lives. Um, and we could always do this. You know, it was always sort of available to us. But we are we are utilizing these opportunities to come together with people from across the globe mm -hmm. to really affect change in ways that I don't think we've ever done before. Um, so I do think there's been some real value in, in seeing this disruption, as, as Justice McCormick said, uh, as a real opportunity to come together and think strategically about how we can make, th make the delivery of legal services better for everyone. And, and I, I think that that's the next question I had for, for the lawyers helping in this, for the legal counsel helping in this, what what sort of uh, impact have they seen? Is it is it that they can do more? Is it they can reach more? Um, what what are the impacts for them? I think that's absolutely what they're seeing. You know, we have been able to do a lot virtually. Um, you know, and it, it it has not inhibited our ability to be engaged in service mm -hmm. um, to work very closely with legal services organizations who quickly reach capacity 
and need that pro bono support to really supplement what they're doing. Um, so it really has allowed people to plug into opportunities in ways that they just haven't really contemplated before. So I do think it has increased the impact um, of not just law firm pro bono, but pro bono in general. In general, right. More people are plugging in um, because we all sort of recognize that there's there's this need is, is not going away and it's only been increased uh, because of the pandemic. So if if anyone from our audience, you know, regardless of whether they're uh, a lawyer, a technologist, uh, just someone who is very drawn to serving, um, if they wanted to get involved, if they wanted to find ways to connect and and help, mm -hmm. where might you send them? I, I first would say, follow you and follow Bridget on Twitter. That would be my first my first thing. <laughs> but what else? What else? You know, it's it's such a good question. Um, you know, there are sort of statewide legal aid programs everywhere uh, in the United States. And those organizations are always anxious to connect with lawyers and others mm -hmm. to be able to serve the people who call their offices, who come to their offices, who are applying for services online all the time. You know, those organizations don't have the funding capacity to do the things technologically that they would love to be able to do. So having a legal technologist contact them to say, hey, I've got this skill. You've got this need. Let's work together. They would love that. Absolutely love that because I can assure you every executive director of one of these programs has some idea, some way that they want to infuse technology into their work and they don't know where to start. And that's where the minds of these technologists can be so huge. It has helped me in prior positions to connect with legal technologists who say, listen, we, we know you've got a mission. We know you have a passion for this work. How can we help you make some of these things happen? Um, that that's what I would say, you know, legal services, corporations sort of list all of their uh, legal aid programs on their website, connect with one of those organizations in your state. Uh, and see how you can help them. My goodness, uh, Tiffany, you have amplified so much of this topic for us today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and for sharing your knowledge. And oh my goodness, I am tuning in to the International Bar Association event. That sounds like like just again a kind of seminal event for for all of us to see how we can help facilitate this international worldwide issue. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to share. I, I think my passion for this work is, is obvious. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I always enjoy learning from others and finding ways to work together to advance justice. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Yeah.